All right. Well, hi, everyone. Hopefully you can hear us all loud and clear. So uh, first of all, welcome. Uh, this is the second um, live event as part of our World Space Week um, set of virtual activities for 2020. Um, and uh, I am Shanta Nobbs. I'm the chair of the Institute of Physics South Central branch. Um, to see all the activities that we have planned over the next week for World Space Week, you can head over to our Facebook page and also our Twitter pages uh, and just search for Institute of Physics South Central branch and you'll see all the activities that we have planned uh, over the week, all free, all virtual, so do take a look. Uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker today is Dr Elizabeth Cunningham. She's from the SDFC uh, and also from the University of Surrey. And Elizabeth's going to talk to us today about radiation protection, how to survive a journey to Mars. So if you have questions throughout the talk, please do pop them into the questions box, into the Q&A box, and we'll pick those up at the end. Uh, but I'll hand over now to Elizabeth and uh, leave it over to you. Thanks, Chantelle. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today on this rainy afternoon. I hope that I'm going to entertain you by talking to you about this interesting subject. Uh, it's quite uh, a weird subject, so I'll just first talk about how I got interested in it. So um, I, my research background is in nuclear physics at the University of Surrey, so I've always been interested in, in nuclear physics and radiation protection. Um, but my current job, working for the STFC at the University of Surrey, before I had that job, I worked as an astronomer at the Royal Observatory Greenwich. I've always been interested in space. And so that's when I started uh, thinking about um, space travel and traveling to Mars. And this, uh, this aspect of how to survive a journey to Mars really um, interests me because of my research background as well. So that's how I got interested in this topic. Hopefully I'm gonna interest you in it as we progress today. So, uh, let's begin. Who, so when, if I was giving this talk uh, to a live audience in a lecture theatre, normally I would ask at this point, who would like to go to Mars? So if you, um, you should have on your screen, everyone watching, you should have a little hand with an arrow on it and you can press that to put your hand up. So if you could do that to give me an indication of um, how many of you would like to go to, on a journey to Mars, that would be great. I would like to go to Mars, I would quite like to go to Mars. Um, but I would like, I'd be interested to see how many of you still put your hand up at the end of the talk after we've talked about all the issues that we have to do. But, okay, so if we wanted to go to Mars, there are various uh, practical issues that we have to overcome in all seriousness. Um, there is uh, a checklist here of the things that we have to think about. So conservative estimates of how much it would cost us to get to Mars is that it will cost uh, $500 billion minimum. So we need quite a lot of money, but that is only the wealth of the 20 richest Americans. So we only have to convince 20 people to pay for us to go to Mars. So if we could do that, if we could get the money together, we then have to consider um, the mental health issues, so the psychological effects of uh, traveling to Mars. And I think uh, we could use Netflix or other streaming services are available to combat that aspect of the problems of going to Mars. So I think if we had enough to watch, uh, to get there, we could we could cope with that. There are the health problems associated with being in low gravity for such a long period of time and the confinement that you would find in the spacecraft. Um, but we've been doing lots of uh, studies on that on astronauts in low gravity for long periods of time in our space stations. And here's a picture of Tim Peake running the London Marathon when he was up at the International Space Station. So, you know, if he can run a marathon, we can probably make sure that we keep our health and fitness going during the journey to Mars. And then there's also the problems of the technical challenges of going to Mars. So we need the spacecraft, we need to build a, a Mars base, we need to take the supplies with us that we need for the entire journey. But there are people working on this. So hopefully at some point in the future, uh, either Elon Musk or Richard Branson will be able to sell us a ticket to go to Mars. And then we also have uh, the opportunity of using virtual reality and augmented reality and headsets in order to expand our environment we're in the spacecraft. So while there are various practical problems of going to Mars, given enough money and enough uh, effort, we could probably overcome each of these problems. 
Now, the one, prob the one thing we need to consider that we don't necessarily know the answer to is how do we, over the two and a half year round trip that it'll take us to get to Mars, how do we protect ourselves from the space environment, from the space weather, from the radiation? So this is what this talk is about. We're trying to consider how we're going to protect ourselves from space weather. Now, I've just seen that uh, in the audience, there's only six people who want to go to Mars. So we'll see. I'll be interested to see if, if there are fewer people or more people on the end of the talk who still want to go to Mars. But we're starting with six. I think with me, that's seven. OK, so we've got seven people who want to go to Mars at the moment. OK. So yes, it's going to take two and a half years to get there and back. What do we need to think about the space weather? Now, when I'm talking about space weather, I mean, uh, I'm going to use these terms interchangeably. So I'm talking about space weather, I'm talking about space radiation. So space weather is high energy particles that come from various sources um, that cause radiation. So there are three main uh, sources of space weather uh, in the solar system. There's large solar flares that come from the sun. There's galactic cosmic rays that come from outside the solar system. And then there's the radiation belts. So that's uh, radiation, that's high energetic, high, highly energetic particles trapped in the magnetic field around the Earth. We call them um, the radiation belts. So those are th the three main sources of radiation that we have to think about when we're traveling to Mars. And we'll have a look at each of those sources in turn throughout the talk. Um, but what, so this space weather or space radiation, what effects can it have? What does it pose a danger and what can it do? So if we think generally about the effects of space weather on Earth, um, there are various different things that can happen due to space weather. One of the nicer things is uh, it causes the aurora. So if anyone's been fortunate enough to see the northern lights, um, the aurora at the north, northern and southern pole, the polar areas is caused by space weather from the sun. But it can have a detrimental effect to our satellites, to our communication networks, to uh, planes, to aviation flying around the Earth, and to electric power grids as well. So all these things can be negatively affected by space weather. But what we're going to focus on today is the effect of space weather on human space exploration, in particular on travelling to Mars and how we're going to get, get to Mars. So thinking about the effects of space weather on humans, you can have a look at the different types of radiation levels and how that influences the human body. Now, as a nuclear physicist, I was always taught that a little bit of radiation is good for you. And we are in fact built uh, quite well to withstand a small amount of radiation. There's background radiation everywhere. And we get uh, exposed to medical sources of radiation through dental x-rays, through chest x-rays, as I said, there's, a, there's a, a, a natural level of radiation that we're constantly exposed to, but we are very well designed and our, our cells, our DNA replication pro pro processes uh, cope with this background radiation. So if there's damage, there are mechanisms in order to repair the DNA and make sure that our cells reproduce correctly. Um, but if you get to higher levels of radiation, then those mechanisms that protect us break down. As I said, we are all exposed to a, a certain amount of radiation just in the background. And uh, one of the most common, if you're not flying across the Atlantic a lot on transatlantic flights, one of the most uh, common uh, sources of radiation in your life will be um, the person that you sleep next to at night. So we are all a little bit radioactive, we're made of carbon. And one type, one ice type of carbon, carbon-14, is radioactive. So all the people around you give off a little bit of radiation. I give off a little bit of radiation. So when I go to bed at night and sleep next to my husband, we are irradiating each other. But as I said, we're designed to cope with a little bit of radiation. But it just, you know, just bear in mind when you're considering who you're going to sleep next to at night that they are giving a little bit of a radiation dose. So that amount of radiation is completely normal. But as we get higher, as we get to higher levels of radiation, then we can start to damage the human body. And so this is what we need to think about when we're being exposed to radiation in space travel. So this picture that you can see on the slide shows you the different levels right up to the top level, which is uh, the, the dose of radiation uh, that would kill you. So we definitely want to protect our astronauts for that kind of radiation exposure. So that's what we need to think about. That's the problem we need to solve when traveling to Mars. So let's go back and have a look at our sources of space weather. As I said, we're going to have a look at each one of them in turn. And we're going to start with the sun 
with uh, solar photon flares from the sun. So let's have a look at solar activity. So I just want to point out that this picture is not to scale. We have the sun and we have the earth here. And if you learn about the earth uh, in, in, in secondary school and primary school, and you were taught about the earth's magnetic field, you probably learned about it in terms of a dipole magnet. Uh, in fact, if, if the earth had a, as if the earth had a bar magnet, a north and south pole running through the center, and it had a, a symmetrical magnetic field around it. Now, what actually happens is that the sun, the, the material that's coming off the sun, this space weather or space radiation, interacts with the Earth's magnetic field and it squishes it on the side of the Earth that's facing the sun. So if we actually look what the Earth's magnetic field actually looks like, you can see here, and the Earth's magnetic field gets squished by the sun. Now, this is good for us. The Earth's magnetic field basically acts as a shield or a barrier for us from space weather and space radiation. Um, so this, the, the material coming off the sun, it squishes the magnetic field at the, start, at the front of the sun, and then it is funneled around the magnetic field and forms a long magnetotail going behind uh, the Earth. So all, most of the material from the sun is deflected around the Earth normally at normal levels of uh, solar activity from the sun. Now, you can sort of see at the north and south pole, the Earth's magnetic field forms kind of a funnel and particles can get in, they can get trapped on the magnetic fields and they can spiral down, uh, the, the particles from the sun can spiral down to the north and south, south pole. And these are highly energetic particles and when they do that, they interact with the Earth's atmosphere, they give off their energy and that's how we see the aurora. So this interaction between the, the, the solar wind, this material coming off of the sun and the Earth's magnetic field, this interaction is what gives us the aurora. So this material can funnel down into the poles. And that's why you mainly see aurora at the north and south pole, because it gets, it gets funneled by the Earth's magnetic field. But the majority of the material is deflected around the Earth, and that's great for us. The magnetic field forms this um, great shield against space radiation. But you can see aurora. I, I can't help but put in a picture of the aurora that I took when I was on holiday in Norway a few years ago. It really is a beautiful sight if you haven't had a chance to go and uh, see the aurora and then put it on your on your bucket list. And we'll talk about the best time to go and see aurora uh, in the next on the next slide. So the material is constantly spewing off the sun, but there is a solar cycle of maximum and minimum activity. And this solar cycle follows uh, an 11 year cycle. So anyone who follows uh, the sun updates in the news, uh, we'll realise that we've just been announced that we've, we've ended, just ended the current solar cycle. So cycle 24 has just finished and we're now moving into cycle 25. So this, this uh, slide shows up to the end of cycle 24. So we're actually at a solar minimum at the moment. It's not the best time to go and see uh, the northern lights at the moment. Probably want to wait about five and a half, six years and we'll be back up at a solar maximum. And then you're Statistically more likely, it's never guaranteed, but you're more likely to see uh, aurora at uh, the maximum of a solar cycle. So various behaviours of the sun follow this cycle, including sunspots, which is what has been counted here in this graph. Um, but also uh, the ac actions from the sun that cause material to be ejected into space, that causes this space weather. So solar flares and coronal mass ejections. These activities also follow this cycle. So when you're at a maximum peak of the cycle, more material is being spewed out into space. So you can use that to think about when you want to send your astronauts to space, that you're less likely to have, um, or there'll be less, fewer uh, flares and coronal mass ejections during a solar minimum. Um, now, solar particle events is when a serious amount of material is ejected out into space from the sun. These flares and coronal mass ejections, they're very unpredictable. So if you think about the weather here on Earth, we have been studying the, the weather system on the Earth for decades. We have numerous uh, meteorological stations across the world taking data all the time. And we still can't predict the weather. When I checked the forecast yesterday, it wasn't supposed to rain today. And here I am, uh, uh, surrounded by rain. So it's very difficult to predict uh, weather. So trying to predict space weather is even more difficult. And we only have one satellite dedicated to, to monitoring data for space weather. So we have one source of data to try and predict uh, space weather from the sun. So it really is very difficult to do. They do do a surprisingly good job at it, of it, uh, if you've subscribed to any of the space weather uh, websites. 
but it is notoriously difficult to do. So you can't really predict when these storms are going to happen. And the trouble is that you can get this background of material constantly spewing off the sun. Our, 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 the Earth's vanity field protects us. We get lovely aurora. And that's, that's, that's all that happens. That's all that happens most of the time. But sometimes, every once in a while, you can get a big solar storm, a big solar particle event, and it can be lethal. So I want to, um, to make this point, I want to think about uh, the Apollo missions, because the Apollo missions are, they're the only astronauts, so the, the 12 men who left the Earth to travel to the moon, they are the only, they're the only people who've left the protective bubble of the Earth's magnetic field. So all the other astronauts, all the space stations, everything else that we've done has always been inside the Earth's magnetic field, so we've always had this protection. Whereas the astronauts that left uh, to go to the moon, they left this protection. So NASA had to seriously consider what it was going to do in, in the event of, of bad space weather. Um, I've got a graph here uh, showing um, the space weather during the time of the Apollo missions. So I'm sorry about the quality of it. This is the best quality. It's quite, from quite an old paper. So this is the best quality image of this graph that I could I could find. But we're going to talk through what it shows, so you can see what what how it, uh, the space weather was for the mission for the Apollo missions. So down the left hand side of the graph is just a, a measure of radiation level. So the higher up the graph, the higher the radiation. And the blue lines, the blue um, vertical lines. They are solar storms, so they're bad space weather events that happen during the time of the Apollo missions. And the grey lines are the Apollo missions, so they're, they're labelled um, 7 to 17. So you can see how these solar particle events uh, happened uh, where, in relation to the actual Apollo missions. Now, the horizontal lines up the graph show different doses of radiation, so the green horizontal line at the, at the bottom of each graph shows the average dose that you get living on Earth. So the, the average radiation dose that we all receive walking around, sleeping next to people at night, eating bananas, all those things. The next level, so the red line, is the maximum annual dose that a radiation worker is allowed. So someone who works with radiation, it's their day-to-day -day, um, day -day, uh, job, that's how much radiation they're allowed to be exposed to in a year. The next line up, so the first of the grey horizontal lines, um, if you're exposed to that amount of radiation, then you have an increased risk of developing cancer later in life. The next line, the, the second grey line up from the bottom of the chart, if you get exposed to that level of radiation, then you may, you may, become, you may suffer from radiation sickness. And then the grey line at, at the top of the graph, if you get exposed to that level of radiation, then you, you will instantly die. So there's quite a, you know, there's quite a, a range on this graph. So at the bottom, the green line, that's how much everyone gets exposed to radiation on the Earth. And then that third grey line from the bottom, that is, if you receive that amount of radiation, then you will die. So we can have a look and see what level of radiation solar storms are going on at the time of the Apollo. So if we reveal Apollo 13 and 14, you can see that the grey line of the Apollo 13 mission they just missed uh, a solar storm that would have increased their risk of developing cancer later in life. But the Apollo 13 astronauts, they had other things to worry about, so they weren't worried about space, they were worried about other things. And the same with the Apollo 14 mission, they just missed a, um, a, a solar storm of the same, uh, um, same danger. So very lucky so far, Apollo astronauts very lucky. If we look at the later missions, 15 and 16, uh, see, it's very quiet. There's not a lot going on. Again, 16 just missed a, uh, a solar particle event that would have uh, increased their risk of cancer. But no, none of the astronauts were actually out of the Earth's magnetic field during any of these events. But between Apollo 16 and 17, there was a very bad solar storm. That if any of the Apollo astronauts had been on the moon at that time, they would have died. So this is a very real danger that we have to consider when sending people outside of the Earth's sanity field. We have, to, we have to have ways that we can protect them from these kind of solar events because they do happen. So this is over a five year um, time span. As I said, going to Mars, we're probably going to have left the Earth magnetic field for about two and a half years. So we need to, we need to know what we're going to do about this. So I'm just interested of those six people who, uh, who are going to come with me to Mars, whether they still want to come. You can click on your hand and let me know if you still want to come.
So we need to think about what we're going to do. Now, obviously, uh, the people of NASA, they were aware of these risks and they had protocols of what, what they were going to do should, should a bad solar storm happen when the astronauts were on the moon. And the protocol for solar particle events, this is one of my favourite facts, so if, if so, there would be some warning. So we'd see that the active the, the, the material had been spewed off the sun. We'd see it on Earth. We'd be able to communicate to the Apollo astronauts that this stuff is coming. So the protocol is that they would put on their spacesuits, they would get out of the lander, and they would go underneath the lander, and then they would lie on top of each other. So you'd have one astronaut on the ground, and you'd have one astronaut lying on top of them, and they would do that for 15 minutes, and then they would switch. So basically, you'd have the, all of the material in the lander protecting them from the events, right? Then you'd have the astronaut on top of you protecting you. And so you basically, if you want, if you're the astronaut underneath, you'd have the maximum shielding you could possibly have during that event. And so you'd do that for 15 minutes and then you'd switch. So then the person, the other person would get protected for 15 minutes and you'd do that until the solar particle event ended. Luckily, they didn't have to do that, but that was the actual protocol for what they should have done. So that's space weather source one, uh, solar flares, solar particles from the sun. Uh, the second source that we're going to look at is galactic cosmic rays. So these are high, highly energetic particles that come from outside the solar system, so from the galaxy and beyond. When these particles interact with the interstellar mediums, this is just gas and dust that lies between the, solar, between the star systems, um, it emits gamma rays. This is a gamma ray map of the sky as we see from Earth. Um, so gamma rays are uh, emitted when these galactic cosmic rays pass through the interstellar medium. Uh, and we think uh, that they are very energetic, They've, they're traveling very fast through space because they've been accelerated close to the speed of light by supernova remnants, although we're not really sure how that mechanism works, but that's what we think. And the galactic uh, cosmic rays, this source of space weather or radiation, is what dominates the radiation exposure of, of our astronauts in space stations. So in the International Space Station, in the Mir Space Station, this is what dominates their radiation exposure because they're still within the magnetic fields, so they still get protected from the sun, but these energetic particles can still get through uh, and influence them. And so uh, they studied this uh, very early on. Uh, so in the Skylab, uh, space station they had the, one of some of the earliest galactic cosmic ray measurements and they did a really beautiful simple experiment you know working in nuclear physics our, our experiments are so complicated they can take weeks to get hold of to get them straight in your mind uh, but so when you hear just a truly simple beautiful experiment that does the job it's really nice so this they did a really nice experiment because basically what happens is when a galactic cosmic ray passes through an astronaut's head if it, if it triggers the right neurons, it causes a flash in the astronaut's retina. So basically, uh, astronauts uh, in the space stations early on reported that when they were sleeping and they had their eyes closed, they would see flashes of light behind their eyelids. And basically, these were galactic cosmic rays shooting through their brain and, and firing neurons. So they did a study of this, and the beautiful, a beautifully simple experiment that they did was that they blindfolded one of the uh, astronauts and they just got them to say yes or no, or yes, when, a, uh, when they saw a spark of light in their retina. And so someone would have a, have a map and they would mark down on the map where they were when that astronaut saw uh, a spark of light. So this is the, uh, the results that they, they got from this simple experiment. And they had a, a fairly even distribution of their orbit around the Earth when they would see these flashes, except over the South Atlantic, so there's a circle highlighted there on this graph and when the space station was traveling over the south atlantic they would get loads and loads and loads of flashes uh, in their retina and so they didn't they, they wanted to understand why there was this source of radiation in this particular area it's always in this particular area of the earth and it's still there today so when um satellites say the hubble if the hubble ever goes over this part of the earth it shuts down and protects itself from this, this source of radiation and in order just to understand what's causing this anomaly, we have to look at the third source of space weather uh, and space radiation, which is the trapped radiation in the Earth's um, radiation belts. So I'm just going to have a sip of water, excuse me. <clears throat> so the Earth's radiation belts, called the Van Allen belts, after the, uh, the scientist who discovered them, 
these are this is caused by the Earth's magnetic field and basically material from the sun or from the galactic cosmic rays they get trapped by the Earth's magnetic field. Charged particles can't travel across magnetic fields; they spiral along. So what happens is these particles get trapped by the magnetic field lines, they spiral along. And as they get to the poles where the magnetic field lines are close together, they bounce back, so they get as far as they can and then they bounce back and they basically just get trapped, going up and down, up and down in these radiation belts. And it's mainly material from the sun and from the galactic cosmic rays. So here's a picture, a schematic picture of the Van Allen radiation belts. So there's an outer belt and an inner belt. And they span from about 1,000 to 60,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface. And there's this very strange thing that happens because the Earth's rotational axis, so the axis about which the Earth spins, and the Earth's magnetic axis are slightly out of sync. So they're, they're out of alignment. So as the Earth spins, the magnetic field spins at the same time, but just at a slightly different angle. So what this means is that over the South Atlantic, the Earth's magnetic field is shifted closer to the Earth. So the, uh, so the, magnetic, the radiation belts um, over the South Atlantic are much closer to the surface of the Earth as they, or as they are compared to anywhere else on Earth. So this is why you get this South Atlantic anomaly, why astronauts, as they travel through this region of space, they get many more flashes of, of light in their eyes, is because they're traveling through the radiation belt. As the rest of their orbit, the radiation belts are above them, because of this shift in the magnetic field relative to the Earth's rotational axis, you get this South Atlantic anomaly. And it's the South Atlantic anomaly, this is where this sort of field connects to the work that I do now for, for the Science and Technology Facilities Council. I mainly do now public engagement in science. And one of the um, organisations that I work for actually study this uh, on the International Space Station. So if we look at the International Space Station. It has an altitude of about 400 kilometers. So it's not, it's not a huge amount, a huge distance. Obviously it's quite, quite high up. It's about the distance between London and Cornwall. So that's how high up they are above the Earth. So normally the radiation belt is way above that. It's a thousand kilometers. So the, the ISS astronauts wouldn't have to worry about this. Um, be, but because of this South Atlantic anomaly it has a minimum altitude of about 200 kilometers. So the ISS and other space stations do travel through this radiation patch. Now the organisation that I worked for, uh, or I worked with to study this, is called uh, the Institute for Research in Schools. This is a really great organisation, it's a charitable trust, and it supports school children actually doing uh, authentic research. So not doing the experiments that have been done a million times before that we know the results of, uh, they're actually doing new research for the first time, analysing data, looking at uh, things that have never been looked at before. So it's a really great organisation. It's really inspirational what these children can do. Put some of our scientists to shame. But they have two uh, projects that look at space weather. So they have uh, the Lucid experiment. So this is um, on a spacecraft in orbit around the Earth. Some of the students who are who who formed the first uh, Iris uh, class that so under the teacher who set up Iris. Institute for Research in Schools. They entered a competition. There was a competition for school children to put an experiment on a, on a satellite that would go into orbit around the Earth and they could get the data and analyse it themselves. And the school children, they wanted to um, enter this competition and put an experiment into space. And they just visited CERN, um, the particle physics um, uh, laboratory in Geneva. And they'd seen these Timepix chips and these are small little squares, um, square chips, and they measure radiation and they enable you to visualise radiation. So you can see the different types of radiation visualised on a computer screen using these tiny chips. And while they were there, they, they, one of the students asked the teacher and said, do you think anyone's ever put these chips in space? Because it'd be really useful to study astronaut radiation exposure, to study satellite, how satellites are exposed to radiation, and how that uh, affects their how they operate. And the teacher said, oh, I'm sure someone's thought of that. So they went back after their trip to CERN to the classroom and they researched, but they found that nobody had put these chips in space. They were, they were not in space at all. So they entered this competition and they proposed that they would put uh, these time picks chips on this satellite and they could use that to study the ra radiation environment around the Earth and learn more about how satellites are exposed to radiation. 
Uh, unfortunately, they didn't win the competition because their experiment was too expensive. Uh, but the organizer said, this is such a good idea. If you can raise the amount of money needed to put these chips in space, we'll put them on the satellite as well. So that's what the teacher did. She raised, she called everyone she knew, all, all the organizations around local to her school, and she raised the money. And so these chips did get put in space. Now, in the meantime, uh, NASA hear about this and they're like, oh, these children thought this idea and we've not thought of it ourselves how can we've not put these chips in space and unfortunately the launch of lucid was delayed twice and while it was being delayed nasa put the chips up themselves into the international space station so the students unfortunately were not the first people to put these chips into these detectors into space but they did have the idea first so they can take some comfort in that uh, and because nasa is a wonderful organization they said uh, what they would do uh, because the students inspired them to do this, is that they would share the data that they got uh, on the International Space Station with the students. So when Tim Peake went up to the International Space Station, uh, the uh, IRIS, the Institute for Research in Schools, launched the Tim Picks project because these detectors are called time picks. So we, uh, we have a pun in public engagement. So this, this is the Tim Picks project to measure Tim's peak radiation levels. Uh, and so this is what they did. So they had these detectors in space and they shared the data with the students. And then the students also had the data from the satellite. So they were able to put this together to study the Earth's space environment. So that's what they did. Uh, so these, the chips don't look very exciting. They're just USB sticks on a laptop in the International Space Station. Uh, but that's where the data comes from, that the students analyze. And then they've got this lovely uh, representation of, of, as the International Space Station goes around its orbit around Earth, you can see it's radiation monitoring, and then you can see that South Atlantic anomaly nicely highlighted in the data. So this is work that the students have done. So the students um, have done amazing things with this information and, and had a very uh, fruitful relationship with NASA back and forth. Uh, and then uh, in 2017, their work made headlines because one of the, the students working on this project noticed uh, a problem with the NASA data. And this is a really great example of how diversity in science works, because this uh, student uh, has a visual impairment. So in order to see the data, he had to blow it up really big and look at it very closely. And he was studying the numbers going through the, the data. And he noticed that the, some of the results are coming back negative. So some of the energy results are coming back negative. You can't really get negative energy. So he went to his teacher and he said, oh, I'll get this negative energy in this data. What's going on there? And so they went to NASA and they said, oh, there's something funny going on here. We're not, we're not really sure. And NASA said, oh, yeah, you're right. You've, you've spotted a, an error. And then they went back and figured out what was going on. And then, uh, and then they corrected it. So then the subsequent data was all corrected. So they would have never have spotted that if it hadn't been uh, for these students and for this institute uh, allowing students to contribute meaningfully to, to space uh, research. So it's a wonderful story. Uh, it's kind of how this topic ties into the work that I do. Uh, and they're still, they're still doing projects, various projects in physics and other, other sciences. So those are, that's a, that's a very brief summary of the, the different types of radiation that we need to think about when we want to travel to Mars. Anybody still want to come with me to Mars? Should we, should we still go? Anyone got a spare $500 billion? No, no one's, no one's raising their hand now, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we, we've just got to get to work on the 20 richest Americans. So I'll, I'll get on that and then we can uh, see if we still want to go. But I still want to go to Mars. But we need to figure out what we're going to do about each of these radiation environments, what we're going to do to get through each of them. So if we're traveling to Mars, if we're taking off from the Earth and traveling to Mars, the first radiation source that we're going to encounter are the radiation belts. So we need to think about what we're going to do about the radiation belts. Uh, and again, so the Apollo astronauts are the only, only people who have gone through the radiation belts. And so NASA, again, knew this was a problem. So they were considering what they were going to do. So they had a big workshop to brainstorm ideas about what they're going to do about getting through the radiation belts. And uh, Van Allen, the scientist who discovered them, he actually proposed at this workshop that you should launch a nuclear weapon into space and explode it in the radiation belts. And then that would blow out all of these high energy particles and reduce the amount of radiation in the radiation belt. Now, as a nuclear physicist, I can wholeheartedly tell you that nuclear weapons are never the answer for anything. 
you definitely shouldn't try and do that to reduce the radiation environment around the Earth. And thank goodness they didn't, because um, actually the atmospheric uh, nuclear atomic weapon uh, program, when they launched, when they released uh, atomic weapons in the in the Earth's atmosphere, actually that increased the radiation levels in the radiation belt. So definitely not a good idea. So thank goodness someone at NASA didn't didn't listen to that. So uh, what NASA just decided very sensibly is that they would take uh, a very high uh, trajectory, uh, northern trajectory, so they would travel through the radiation belts where they're at their thinnest. So I think that's probably what we should do as well. We'll do the same thing. We'll just travel travel up to where the radiation belts are at their thinnest so we can get through them quickly, as, as quickly as possible, and minimise our dose. So that's what we'll do about the radiation belts. Our next step, next problem we've got to solve is that it takes about six months to get to Mars. So we've got to travel for six months from the Earth to Mars. We've got to survive outside the Earth's magnetic field for that period of time there, and then also for that period of time back. Um, now, if anybody has a day to lose, I recommend that you go to the NASA website and have a look at their journey to Mars plan, because it's absolutely amazing what they're planning to do. Uh, so they initially they wanted to have humans on an asteroid by 2025 and then have people go to Mars in the 2030s with the current administration. I don't know if they will achieve that, but they have thought very seriously about all the different steps that they need to do in order to get to those milestones. So there's some amazing things on this. So it's this, there's things that are already going on. So Hubble is part of that plan just to you know monitor Mars, to study Mars, to learn it, learn about Mars from a distance. They also have uh, a program of landers, they want to land on the surface of Mars, again, to study the radiation environment, the radiation levels on the surface of Mars and other things, you know, whether we could grow things on Mars, how we would live there. But my favourite part of this plan is called the Asteroid Redirect Mission, and it's straight out of a sci-fi uh, book. So they would like to send astronauts to the, uh, astronauts to the asteroid belt and either redirect a small asteroid or cut a chunk off of a bigger asteroid and redirect it back to the moon. So this, then this chunk of asteroid would go into orbit around the moon and the moon would have a moon. This is absolutely mad, but I love it. So, and in the, in the process of doing this and then having the moon in orbit, having the asteroid in orbit around the moon, this would give, this would train the asteroids basically in all the skills that they would need to, to get to Mars and to, to to, to live on the surface. So yes, this is a wonderful website, Journey to Mars, NASA. If you have if you have half a day to spare, a day to spare, just go and lose yourself in the amazingness that will be a, a Journey to Mars. Okay, so we've got six months there. You might want to buy your ticket from NASA. You might also want to buy your ticket from SpaceX. So Elon Musk might be selling tickets, um, you know, travel to Mars in a Tesla, who knows? What will be going on in the 2030s but whoever we buy our ticket from there'll be a six month journey to mars and then once we get to mars so six months is about the shortest distance we could do it in once we're on mars we probably have to wait about a year and a half for the earth and mars to get back into their sh shortest distance to have the shortest journey back so probably over a year on the surface we'd have to survive so um, what do we know about the radiation environment on the surface of Mars? So there's various landers on Mars studying this. Uh, here's a picture of the Curiosity rover. Uh, I think this is a selfie that Curiosity took of itself, uh, which is a wonderful, uh, wonderful social media feat. Um, so yes, yeah, so Curiosity is measuring the radiation, environment, radiation levels on Mars. And it turns out Mars does not have a magnetic field, but it has a thin atmosphere. And that atmosphere protects protects things on the surface of Mars from the worst of the space weather, from the space radiation. So radiation levels on the surface of Mars are at about the same level as they are on, on, on our space stations, on the International Space Station. So probably while we're on the surface of Mars, once we've built our you know, Mars base and our habitat, then probably we'll be all right. So we don't need to worry too much about the radiation environment while we're on the surface of Mars. Um, anybody who is into social media should follow Curiosity on Twitter because you can get tweets from Mars, although presumably the tweets have had to come from the Earth and back to Mars. But anyway, it's quite cool to get a tweet from Mars so you can follow uh, Curiosity at Mars Curiosity. Uh, so we'll probably be alright on the surface uh, for a year or so, and then we've got the six-month journey back. 
So really, the dangerous periods are when we're traveling six months there and six months back there. So we're going to be exposed to the, the worst of the space weather. So we need to have a think about what we can do, but also how often these solar storms occur. You don't actually have to go that far back in time to find a really bad solar storm. So uh, the last one probably was in 2012. So just before uh, the Olympics were going to start in London, so just a few days before. And a month or so after I got married, so it's a good year for me as well. But the sun had other ideas. So you can see this is an image of the sun with the actual sun itself blocked out. And you can see on the right hand side of the image, this huge amount of material being expelled out into space. So this is one of those solar particle events when a huge amount of high, highly energetic material is ejected from the sun. But here is a, a GIF of the same event. So the sun is at the center of this, and you can see it will play on repeat. Um, every so often, a huge, you can see a huge amount of material is expelled from the surface of the sun. Now, the other things in this picture, the squares are the very satellites we have uh, in orbit around the sun, the sun in the sun, and then the circles are the planets. So for some reason, Venus is green. Uh, and the Earth is yellow. I don't know why, but there we go. So you can see that the Earth is yellow. So we were actually on the on the wrong side of the sun when this happened. So we missed this solar storm uh, by about eight days. So if it had happened eight days later, then the Earth would have been on the other side of the sun, and we would have um, we would have got a full on blast. And estimates of how much damage this would have done to our satellite infrastructure, our energy infrastructure, our GPS systems. It's estimated that it would have cost about half to two trillion dollars to repair the damage that would have been caused by this solar storm. So while it wouldn't necessarily have caused any harm to the people on Earth, it would have caused a lot of damage to our satellite infrastructure. So these are, this is something that we have to start thinking about now. Now, as we're becoming, as we're becoming more and more dependent on electricity and on satellites, that these solar storms, when they happen, if the Earth is in the firing line, then you know there's a lot, there's a lot of damage that can be done. Because if you go back a little bit further in time, so if we go back to the solar storm that happened in 1989, some of you might remember this that the, it wiped out the power grid on the eastern eastern Canadian seaboard. Um, there were aurora much lower down the hemisphere than there usually are. In fact, I was giving this talk to an astronomical society in Dorset, and one of the guys said, oh, I was out that night and I saw the aurora in my garden in Dorset. They even sent me a picture so I could put it in the talk. So this is a picture, thank you very much, um, Bob Mizzen. Uh, this is a picture of the aurora that he took from his garden in Dorset on that day. So. So just a this isn't a, as powerful a storm, but it, it, again, it had it had real uh, real implications, mostly beautiful ones in terms of the aurora. But I bet there were a lot of annoyed Canadians to lose their power over the solar storm. And then another famous historic uh, solar storm is called the Carrington event that happened in 1859. And again, we weren't we weren't so technically technologically advanced in those days, but we did have telegraph systems. And this solar storm blew up telegraph systems. Some telegraph systems, they disconnected from the power and they kept going because they'd been charged by the solar storm. There were aurora displays uh, in Boston, uh, in Hawaii and in Cuba. And material, when it's spewed from the sun, it usually takes about two to three days to reach there. So you do have a bit of mourning when they have these events that you've got two or three days for the stuff to get to us. This was so energetic, this event, that it took 17.6 hours to reach Earth. So it was very, very quick. Uh, so the storm took very quick, very quickly reached us. So obviously people are aware of this danger of these solar storms and they are monitored. And we uh, we have uh, a team or a group at the University of Surrey who um, use uh, UK space instru instrumentation to monitor these, these events. Uh, and you can see in this graph, again, there's a measure of radiation along the left hand side and then time along the bottom. And you can see the peaks of these, these solar particle events. And the last solar cycle I've highlighted there at the end, so we've just, just finished cycle 24, we're just moving into cycle 25. Um, so you can see these, these events do happen. Mostly they're at a level that we can cope with, our magnetic field protects us, they don't, the damage that isn't, doesn't, we don't see any damage. 
the, the main problem we have is that most of our technological developments happened in the last few decades and that is when the solar cycle has been relatively low so you can see here if we look again at the 11 year solar cycle that there's peaks and troughs but the peaks are, are gradually diminishing and there's a there's a cycle within the cycle if you like and so the the activity of the sun uh, decreases and eventually it will ramp up again and so we've established all this technology in a, in a period of relative quiet uh, we're talking about going to mars again in, in this period of re relative quiet but ultimately the sun will ramp up again the activity will increase and then these dangerous events are more likely uh, to happen so what is the plan obviously nasa and elon musk and everybody has thought very long and hard about we're going to get people to mars and one of these events happen what do we do so what what is the current plan and why am i showing you a picture of tim peak with a space toilet now again if you have uh, any if you have some spare time obviously you can get lost on youtube but one video i recommend that you do is worthwhile watching is tim peak demonstrating a space toilet it's very good uh, you should have a look at that so what why am i showing you this so when we're thinking about how we're going to protect ourselves from this space radiation we need to think about what what it is actually we're protecting ourselves from so if we go back to the three sources of radiation it's mostly highly energetic small particles so hydrogen and helium that we want to protect ourselves from so this is the proton proton is the hydrogen nucleus coming off the sun galactic cosmic rays are mostly hydrogen and helium with some heavier elements this material is also trapped in the uh, Earth's radiation belts. So if we're going to use something to protect ourselves, we want to use something of a similar size. So if we're looking to protect ourselves from energetic small particles, we want to use small particles as a shield. Because otherwise you're trying to protect yourself. So if you say you're trying to stop a tricycle with a truck, if a tricycle hits a truck, it's just going to propel itself off again. But if you have something of a similar size to stop it, then the particle will actually stop it, won't just bounce, recoil off highly energetically and just cause just as much damage. So what we want to use are small particles like hydrogen and helium to stop this material. Now, um, as we know, uh, water is in a lot of organic matter and that is made of hydrogen and oxygen, H2O. So basically we can use organic matter as a shield from these highly energetic but small particles. So that is why I'm showing you a picture of a space toilet. Because on our journey to Mars, what we would do is we'd have at the front of the spacecraft, we'd have a heat shield for going in and out of, of atmospheres. And behind that heat shield, you would store all your food and water, all your supplies that you needed for your mission to Mars. And then behind all those supplies, you would have your radiation shelter where you would, you would shelter in the case of one of these events. And when there was a, a solar particle event, you would, you would position your nose, your heat shield towards the sun, you would make sure you've got all your supplies and you would hunker down in your in your radiation shelter and wait the storm out but what this means is that as you use your supplies as you use your water and your food and you use your space toilet you can't jettison your waste out into space because you still need to keep it for a shield so it means all the waste products that you produce as you use your supplies also need to be stored in a separate compartment to your supplies but it also needs to be stored around your radiation shield around your shelter so that you can use it if one of these um, solar events happens. So waste not want not on a mission to Mars, you need to keep all of your waste, as I said, in separate compartments, so you can use it to protect yourself from space radiation. So yes, that's, that's, the, that's the low tech, slightly gla less glamorous solution that we're considering. Um, so yes, if you do get a chance, do watch Tim Peake demonstrating the uh, space toilet on YouTube. That is the urine suction tube. I believe there's a separate, different attachment for women, but I don't think he demonstrates that. But yes, so that's the low-tech solution. What is the high-tech solution? So the high-tech solution is to look at smart materials that we can use to protect ourselves uh, from, from space weather, from space radiation. So one of the materials that NASA are seriously looking at to protect them, protect astronauts, is called hydrogenated boron nitride nanotubes. And the main, the important part of that name is the hydrogenated, the hydrogen. So they're adding hydrogen to a material, so it's a lo lo uh, low mass particle, the same as the type of radiation we're protecting ourselves. So when the radiation collides with this material, it gets stopped rather than scattering off. So the reason that this particular material is, is 
sort of a front runner for what we're going to use is because it's very strong so you can use it to um to make your spacecraft so that your spacecraft would have this material all throughout it uh, it can survive at a high temperature so if you burn it it takes a long time to burn and it's very versatile so yeah if you if you burn it compared to regular paper it's, it's heat resistant uh, because it's versatile, you can also then weave it into your spacesuit and your clothes. So you could have it in the structure of the, the spacecraft, but you could also have it in your clothes and in your spacesuit. So you're protected. You have this extra layer of protection in your clothes. And this is one of the important points that I want to get across in this talk is that there's not going to be one solution that will protect our astronauts from space weather. We're going to have to use lots of different things that all help and together make it a safe journey to Mars. So we've got, we're going to have to use our waste um, behind the radiation shelter. We're going to have to use smart materials to put our spacecraft and our clothes out to protect us and the radiation shelter itself. Um, but is there anything clever, anything uh, scientists can do to add an extra layer of protection? And one of the most promising areas of research that's uh, being done at the moment uh, is happening at, here in the UK at the STFC Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. And they are researching experimental plasma magnetic shields. And this is, this is the sci-fi bit of the talk. We're actually getting into the realms of science fiction. This, uh, I love that this is actually becoming a reality. So what these researchers at RAL are doing is they're looking into using magnetic shields uh, and this has been inspired by studying the moon and studying comets and asteroids. As in, the moon is mostly outside of our Earth's magnetic field, so it's constantly getting bombarded by the material from the sun. But the moon has small pockets of magnetic rock. And you can see a picture here on the left. You can sort of see how the surface of the moon has been protected by this magnetic rock. It's different color from the rest of the surface because the magnetic field generated by the rock is protecting the surface. So scientists thought, well, if, if this can happen on the moon, the, the surface of the moon can be protected by this magnetic rock. Can we emulate this to protect our astronauts in space and then also on Mars? So they've done experiments where they've, in the lab where they've generated uh, you know, an artificial magnetic field. They've generated a dipole-like magnetic field like the Earth to create a mini magnetosphere. And then they've, they've used a plasma source, this is the high, high energy space weather simulation the solar wind source and they've used they've been able to manipulate the magnetic field to create a mini magnetosphere and then this could create in fact a shield to it, that creates a small hole in which a spacecraft could safely shelter now thus far i've shown you actual pictures and text from the scientific paper research paper that was published on this this next slide i photoshopped myself and it's not in the scientific paper but what we are talking about now is shields like they have in Star Trek. So Captain Kirk, Captain Picard goes, raise the shields, the shields go up, and this is what could happen. So Earth could communicate with the, the astronauts going to Mars, going, there's a solar storm coming, and the captain will go, raise shields, and the shields will go up, and they'll protect spacecraft from the, from the, the space weather. This is nuts, but it's amazing. But it, it's true. This is probably the best... Uh, this is probably the, um, the most promising field of research for protecting people outside the Earth's magnetic field. Um, and then I don't, in my talks, I try not to read big bulks of text, but I am going to read the conclusion of this paper because it's, it's awesome. So in the conclusion to this proper scientific paper, uh, they say the evidence that mini magnetospheres actually work on the bulk plasma of space come from magnetic anomalies on the moon around asteroids and comets, both natural and artificial. And this combined with laboratory experiments and simulations suggest that a high energy distribution can be sufficiently affected to justify optimism. So this is the closest you're ever going to get to a scientist saying this science, this science fiction stuff could actually work in reality. So that's pretty exciting. So this is this that's so that's what the UK scientists have said. NASA scientists have just taken this to a whole nother level. And they said, OK, if this in principle works in the lab, what would happen if we built a satellite that generated an artificial magnetic field around Mars? So we put a satellite in orbit around the sun in front of Mars, protected Mars. What would happen? So they've actually had a workshop to brainstorm this. Love it. So what they think would happen, the proper scientists, installing an artificial magnetic field at Mars could 
So it would allow the volcanoes, there's lots of volcanoes on Mars, and it's the most volcanic planet on, in the solar system. So this volcanic outgassing, if, the, if Mars was protected by magnetic field, that would build up and it would thicken the atmosphere. It would raise the temperature by about four degrees. This will cause the carbon dioxide ice in the northern polar ice cap to melt, triggering a greenhouse effect. This would raise the temperature on Mars further, causing water on the southern polar ice cap to melt, leading to water and oceans on Mars. And that would make the holiday on Mars much more comfortable. So this picture, I think they're artists, is an artistic impression. It's taken a bit of artistic license about how much water there would actually be on Mars. But this, 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 what proper sensible scientists are considering what would happen if they could build an artificial magnetic field on Mars. So it's just, just miraculous what you can do, or hopefully we can do in the next few decades. Right, I realise I'm coming, I've, I'm coming to the end of my time, and I want to get some questions. So that's, that's all I'm going to say now. I just want to say thank you to the various people, scientists, teachers, and students who've contributed to aspects of this talk, and thank you very much for listening. And if anyone does have any questions, I'd love to answer them. Thank you very much. OK, I'm going to come back in now. Um, so hopefully my camera mic will, will power up. So <clears throat> thank you very much, Elizabeth. That was a really interesting talk and there was loads in there. Uh, and it was very interesting to see how initially there was quite a reasonable amount of enthusiasm for joining oh, yes, your journey to Mars. Yeah, if anyone will press your hand, if they, who wants to come to Mars with me now? If we be protected by sp spaceships, force fields, I have to see, see what the votes come in. Yeah, so it's looking like, oh, actually, it's it's still it's quite up. a reasonable amount. Yeah, it's it's yeah. gone up. Yeah. <laughs> so you haven't put too many people off, which... Uh, oh, we just need to get to work on those 20 richest Americans to give us the money to go to Mars. <laughs> OK, wonderful. So we've got a few questions that have come in um, and uh, they're actually all from the same person. So um, I'll read them and then it might be best if you actually read them back so that they come up in the captions. So um, so this is from Christopher. So the first uh, question is, are you working with Elon Musk to put Connellists on Mars? I, I'm not working with Elon Musk. I'd love I would love to just spend half an hour and see what's going on in that guy's mind. Uh, but no, I'm not working uh, with Elon Musk. I uh, I have various connections with people who are studying the radiation environment around the Earth. But no, I'll be I'll be like you, Christopher, in the queue to buy my ticket from Elon Musk when he when he starts sending tickets. And uh, the next one from Christopher is, as an adult armchair enthusiast, how do I get involved in physics? How do you get involved in physics? Well, that's a really good question. Um, the first thing I would suggest you could do is to um, have a search for Zooniverse. So that's Z-O-O-N-I-V-E-R-S-E. Um, and they have like a host of what's called citizen science projects. So you can, so various um, aspects of scientific research have, have given data sets to the Zooniverse for people to analyze because they don't have uh, the time or the resources to analyze these big data sets. So places like CERN who are doing part of physics, physics experiments, big uh, astronomical telescopes, they get so much data, they don't have the capacity to analyze it all thoroughly. So what they do is they release data sets to the public uh, so you can analyze data. So, for instance, I think one of the first uh, Zooniverse, um, Zooniverse projects was um, uh, cataloging uh, galaxies. So you got shown, you got trained to uh, identify different types of galaxies, and then you were given images of galaxies, and you had to say that's a spiral galaxy, that's an elliptical galaxy, that's an irregular galaxy, and do this. Um, and they actually show that having people do this online is much more efficient than having some, uh, an artificial intelligence computer, an AI computer trying to do it. People are much more accurate at these things. And so what happens is if you analyze enough data and then you discover something in that data, when they publish the, the peer reviewed science paper, you, your name gets put on the paper. So there's another project where they've done this with exoplanets and you analyze data, try and find planets orbiting around other stars. And the people who have found exoplanets uh, using these citizen science projects, their names get put on the paper. So you can have your name, you know, if you if you analyze the data where a planet is discovered. 
So there's all sorts of um, projects on there now. I think they, they do the stuff about marine weather and you know it's got goes much beyond physics. So if anyone is interested, but yeah, if you if you Google Zooniverse or citizen science, I'm sure there'll be something for you that you can. I mean, they do think there's things on the sun, you know, whatever whatever you're interested in, I'm sure there'll be something there that suits you. Oh, wonderful. I'll, I'll make sure to share a link to that on our Facebook page so that you can find that um, after this talk. So we've actually got a few other questions coming in from other people, but I'll get to Christopher's last question, uh, which is how much power would that shield need to be generated? <laughs> that is the magic question. So it probably take quite a lot of power. So probably on, in traveling to Mars, you might use a combination of power sources. You probably have solar panels and you probably also have some kind of um, uh, you know, nuclear power as well, some kind of combination. Um, so basically you wouldn't be able to run one of those shields all the time. It would just be, there's a bad solar storm coming and it's gonna last this amount of time. So you just turn it on for that period of time. So you're right, it would take a lot of energy and it, you probably wouldn't be able to sustain it for the whole journey. But hopefully, if hopefully one of these fatal events wouldn't happen and you wouldn't have to worry about it in your journey but if it did you'd have that back up and you'd have to you know turn everything off maybe get on some exercise bikes to keep it going um and then you know once it was finished you'd turn it off and you'd repower everything back up and continue on your way but yes it, it would take a lot of energy so it is you know the sensible scientists in the uk have written a paper and they said you know there's there's enough uh, res positive results to be optimistic that this would this could be used. I mean, that's what they've said, and then NASA just run with the idea and said, "Oh, let's build a satellite." Um, so there is a lot more work to do before you go from that lab experiment to the reality of building a spacecraft with shields. But I mean, in principle, it can be done. Okay, so we have another question from Simon, which is, "What would be the most interesting experiment that Elizabeth would like to do when she gets to Mars?" <laughs> Oh, that's tricky. I'm growing potatoes like in the Martian. No. Um, I guess it's not a very physics-y answer, but it probably would be uh, what I want to find out. You know, I want to know, you know, what the content of the soil is on Mars, whether things can be grown there, and then also whether, you know, anything has ever been alive there. And that's the tricky thing would be to go to Mars, obviously, and then you're introducing life forms into the surface and but really you'd want to know if if anything had been alive there before so i think the main experiments i'd want to know about is you know whether there had been any kind of simple life or organic matter or anything going on mars before we got there you'd have to be careful not to contaminate things too much you'd have to do those experiments quite early on because obviously you're going to want to be enriching the soil and growing things and doing stuff like that the minute you get there so i think that's probably what i want to know Oh, very cool. Uh, so another question from Doug. Uh, could you explain again why the South Atlantic anomaly is a spot and not a band around the entire planet, please? Yes. OK, so I've, I had trouble with this concept conception as well when I was first learning about it. Um, so I don't have anything to have any, any props. Right? I'm going to just use, use my hands. So you have the, you know, the globe of the Earth and it rotates around its axis. And then the magnetic field is slightly out of alignment, but it, it rotates at the same rate. So because the magnetic field has shifted the South Atlantic anomaly, the, the radiation belt has shifted towards the South Atlantic, it always stays in the same place relatively because the magnetic field and the Earth rotate at the same rate. So even though they're slightly out of alignment, they rotate at the same rate. So I had problems with this conceptually as well, because magnetic fields aren't really my thing. But it was explained to me that if they didn't rotate at the same rate, then the, the North Pole would move. Like throughout the 24 hour period, the North Pole would move and it doesn't, it, it, it moves very you know, slowly due to other things. Um, it drifts, but not due to this. So that's, so the, the Earth rotates, the magnetic field rotates at the same rate. So the South Atlantic normally stays in the same spot, just not a band. And yeah, so. And, that, and we know that because the North Pole stays in the same place. That's how it was explained to me. Because okay. I also have trouble with that. All right, well, hopefully that um, answered your question, Doug, and we'll move on to um, Mariam's question, which is, can't you just lasso a comet behind a rocket and use that as a blocker? 
I love it. I love it. Really thinking like that. Um, so lasso a comet. It's quite tricky. It'll be quite tricky to lasso a comet. So we've only just developed the technology to land on a comet. So there's been a couple of missions in recent history where people have landed on a comet. Um, the, the Japanese did the high booster missions where they, they landed, captured a thing, and then they came back. And then um, ESA also did a mission, uh, they landed on a comet, but that didn't go so well. You know, it, it didn't land, you know, there was problems in it. Yeah. So it's quite difficult to do. So it's quite difficult just to land on a comet. So lassoing a comet would be very tricky. But if we could, yeah, we could totally utilize that, you know, momentum to keep to keep our to get our spacecraft going. Well, there'd probably be quite a steep acceleration curve. So we'd also have to think about how we're gonna get our um astronauts to survive uh, that kind of G force as they're accelerating quite rapidly uh by a comet. So that yeah, I think so you could do it, but I think that there are there are problems that would arise uh from that. But I like I like your thinking. We need keep thinking like that doesn't sound very comfortable to me <laughs> <laughs> uh, so those are all the questions um if you do have any more questions uh over the next couple of minutes just just drop them into the uh question box uh, i just want to remind everyone again um that this has been the second live talk as part of the world space week um, set of live events that's happening all across the week. So today is the first day and we're going all the way through until the 10th of October um, with a whole variety of live um, sessions that are happening, but also sessions that are just based online that you can dip in and out of uh, when you like. And the best place to go is to head onto our Facebook page or onto our Twitter page. Um, again, it's Institute of Physics South Central Branch. So uh, do have a look there for any further activities that you might want to get involved with. Um, so no additional questions have come into the question box. So I want to say thanks again to Elizabeth for a very interesting talk and our second talk in the series of uh, World Space Week. Um, thank you very much. Thank you and thank you for such wonderful questions. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah.